everyone, and welcome back to another episode of the Reading Party Podcast with Megan and Lexi. This episode continues our season looking at modern retellings of the Iliad and the Odyssey, ancient epics known for both brutal violence and instances of sexual assault. This episode is not suitable for under 18s. We hope you have your favourite beverage and snack ready to go, because we've got our teas and are ready to start spilling the tea on our latest ancient story. This week, Lexi and I watched The Odyssey, a 1997 miniseries. It was pretty fun, but I had some problems, which we will definitely get into. But first, Lexi, what did you think? Overall, Mm -hmm. really actually one of the better adaptations just because it includes pretty much every stop, almost every stop in chapter, which I was not expecting because a lot of times they people do say like we should cut things down for length i mean i suppose i have a warped idea because we watched the miniseries which is posted in its entirety so it's like three hours long on youtube but i will say it probably feels different if you watched it as it was intended to be a two-part miniseries so Mm -hmm. each one being like an hour and a half snippet then you're like oh okay so but yeah i really liked it although as with most reception things i liked it for a lot of reasons I really did not like it for a lot of other like honestly the first 20 minutes I actually really hated it I was kind of just like I don't like this this is weird you know it was it was giving me like Troy the Odyssey vibes at the beginning and I was like oh no oh lord I'm in for one hell of a hard watch and then it got better suddenly Mm -hmm. I was like oh oh actually this is this is fine what did you think Similar, actually, the the first little bit was, so they, it starts on Ithaca with Penelope giving birth, somehow in a field, somehow with Odysseus being her, her midwife, which was an interesting choice. She's a queen. I, I am pretty sure she would not have been out roaming the fields at, what, 40, 41 weeks pregnant. Prob- probably not going to be a good idea or widely encouraged by the rest of the nobility, her husband, you know, things like that. But I did like it in that it really, right at the beginning, it really roots Odysseus in this family and the importance of him being in this family unit and Ithaca as his home. I understood why they made that choice of starting it so early. And then you kind of, you see him blissfully happy with his family and wife and son. And it's what a family is really. That was absolutely superfluous and then he's ripped away by Menelaus and Agamemnon and travels to Troy and then you get like 15 minutes of war and Odysseus kind of narrating bits and pieces and then we lost Achilles who was the best of us who was for some reason mostly naked and wearing (laughs) what gold greaves the greaves were the only item of armor he had on and I, I could be wrong but I'm pretty sure one's shins do not usually require more armor than one's torso where all of the valuable vital organs are stored and no I, helmet no yep yeah, no helmet very nice long flowing hair though <laughs> so that was interesting hector was fascinating as well just coming out and yelling at achilles come and get me and then achilles mm. what throws a spear and then hector's dead yeah, it was very confusing because it was not like a duel like we're normally used to it was like crowds of fighting people and then you just hear come on get me and then you just see like it it, and the camera work is is quite interesting because it doesn't help you really distinguish who's who because then you just see like dude who you're like okay that's achilles so fast just throws spear and then and then you just see like a body go flying and you're like i'm to assume that's hector (laughs) right (laughs) yeah 
And for some reason, there's a child on the battlefield. I know. I was like, why is there a child? And why is Odysseus the only one who seems to notice said child? When I was watching, I was waiting for it to somehow be a god in disguise, trying to get Odysseus away from the fighting, or maybe he's hallucinating and that's Telemachus, except he's not really there because it's a hallucination. No, it's just a random child on the battlefield. And I, I think what they were trying to do was show Achilles, like, Odysseus keep this whole Odysseus's family man in the forefront of the audience's mind. It, it was very strange. And then we finish the war and they all start going back home and Odysseus essentially insults Poseidon as they leave, which is possibly the poorest choice anyone could ever make while embarking on a nautical adventure. And then we kind of, we really launch into the Odyssey as told by Homer. And once we got to the Odyssey bit, I really, really enjoyed it. There were obviously bits that were a little questionable. There were bits that were obviously like smushed together or left out for length purposes. Like you don't get the Lotus Eaters or the Lotus Eaters are kind of smushed in with Cersei, which, you know, makes sense. The Lotus Eater episode is not the most heroic, exciting part of the Odyssey. And then when we get to Phoenicia, Nausicaa just isn't, he doesn't have this amnesia thing and he doesn't go and try and marry a princess. He's just kind of put on a boat and sent off to Ithaca. And that's a whole other thing. So we'll, we will get to that later, I'm sure. But I enjoyed it. I thought it was well paced. Some of the acting was interesting, but also quite funny at times when they get to Circe's Island, the, the men kind of are pissed at at Odysseus because he won't share the like five grains of rice that, or not rice, five grains of wheat that his servant slash slave has found in the ruins of their ship. So they go off to try and hunt wild boar and then come back having found a boar. No, they don't come back. The boar kind of runs into the camp and one of the men runs after and says, no, no, don't eat it. It's one of the men. And that it's obviously Circe has turned them all into animals. So that was quite comical. And then no one believes him and he gets, well, Odysseus believes him, but then Odysseus goes to find the men and this boar gets strung up by the rest of the, the non-animal transformed men. And he transforms back into a man as they're about to light the fire. And, and that was very funny. I enjoyed that quite a lot. One of the things that really, really struck me as we were watching, or as I was watching, was the presence of the gods. And that's something that we kind of talk about quite a lot because it's difficult to do on TV and in movies. And I thought they did a very nice job. It was campy. They were weird and comical, but I really enjoyed having them there. I feel like, honestly, it's almost impossible to truly do the gods well because it, they just, they don't like... When you read it, it like somehow makes sense in your brain, and that's the wonderful thing about literature. But when you watch something, it does not translate, and we've seen this now. A lot of examples of how just what you read does not translate well. So I did like how, what they did. with. I was actually shocked because I didn't think they were going to put the gods in. Or I thought that if they did do the gods, it would only be like dream sequences, almost like in Odysseus' Voyage to the Underworld, where you get the one dream sequence with like Athena. But no, I liked it. And each god was like different too. I mean, I love how you, because you, you start with Athena and well, also it was Isabella Rossellini. I was like, I recognize half this cast as they, they pop up, like the delightful cameos of her. And then like, there's a delightful cameo of Christopher Lee. I was, gonna... I was like, yes. It's funny because also you could tell this was like made 97. So Isabella Rossellini was like pretty young. This was at the beginning of her illustrious career. Also, fun fact, this was one year before she ended up being in that like BBC, like King Arthur series. It was Merlin, Merlin, where she was like young and beautiful and attractive. So to see her around the same era, like one year before, I was like, this is so exciting. Um. Yeah, I liked how they put her in the boat with Odysseus. And then she even says, like, I'm a goddess. I, I can choose who sees me and who doesn't. And so I love how you have him clearly having this, like, intense discussion. And the rest of his boat is just oblivious. They're all laughing and joking. <laughs> no idea that Athena is just kind of hanging out over there with their captain. Yeah, and I was like, 
uh, well, I kept thinking the whole time, do you guys notice Odysseus just like talking? But does it look they like he's all talking very to drunk? Himself? I'm sure. I'm sure they were trying. I just, you know, you have him, he's like gesticulating and he's like, yes, Athena. And I'm like, how do you guys not look over? And if you can't see her, so does it just look like he's like ranting and like talking to himself? It's like even the conversation hidden if she's choosing who can see. So then does it look like he's just like sitting there? I don't know. We will never know because that is not what we saw. But those were things that were going through my head. But I want to go run us back to the very beginning for a minute. And I thought it was a very interesting choice that after this birth and as he's about to go off to Troy, you have this loving Penelope. If there is hair on her son's face and I am not returned, you must remarry. I'm like, look, 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 look. I know what you do in Hollywood. You want him to be the family man who's like, I love you and I'm in it for your interest. But I'm also just like everything we know from like the real Odysseus from the original source material. He is not that like considerate. And in every other adaptation, we're like, no, he's the guy that like, should she have gotten with another dude? He would have been like furious. Like you've betrayed me. So I thought it was an interesting choice to have an adaptation so close to close enough to the original but then you have this one choice where it's like i love you i will do whatever be be free i think i think happy. the character of odysseus is probably one of the the things they changed the most from the original because like not having the lotus eaters okay we can we can go with that not marrying or not getting engaged or no scared absolutely fine but because they're doing this family man thing we have that at the beginning where he, he tells Penelope to remarry for her own interests. And then when he's with Cersei, she magics it so that it's been as far as he knows, what, five days and it's actually been five years. And then he gets super pissed because he's really wants to go back to his wife. It's not like he's just been hanging out for several years. And then we get Cersei, I suppose, not Cersei, Calypso is is pretty similar because by the time he gets to Calypso in in the epic, he is a little bit, he just kind of sits on the beach for a while until he's allowed to go home. But there were lots of little, just really small changes that take him away from this kind of like trickster, philandering trickster type mm -hmm. character and more into the realm of committed family man trying desperately to get back home to his wife and not actually wanting to, to have sex with random goddesses he, he finds on the way. Which begs the interesting question. If you were going to do an adaptation of the Odyssey, would you rather stick closer to the actual timeline of events but change the character of Odysseus, or would you rather have a wild and weird-ass thing where they change things around, but the character is still close to the original? Because I find, found myself thinking quite often about this. I think... I think I'd actually prefer to have an Odysseus more true to what's written because it's it's all of who he is. And while in this one he's he's very clever and he's very brave and he does all the things he's supposed to do, he's not I know there's this edge to him that you get in a lot of other adaptations and you get in the source material. And this this Odysseus is good, but he doesn't have that edge and then when we get to when we get all the way to the suitors and the slaughter of the suitors they very subtly tweak that so it's not Odysseus really running the show most of it is <clears throat> Telemachus like it's Telemachus's fury that's being unleashed and he's he's young and brash and impulsive and okay the audience can kind of I feel like maybe get behind that more because he's been actively abused by these men for years and now is finally able to do something about it. He finally has power in the situation. Odysseus, he kills a couple of people, but it's not its not his fury that we're seeing, which was an interesting change, I thought. Yeah, you know, I, I feel the same because also if you change the character of Odysseus substantially, right? And and then make him into some sappy, very loyal man. Because the thing is, like, 
it changes the way you would perceive his journey to a point that I don't like. Because the thing is, it doesn't make sense then if he's not this cunning dude who's kind of in it for himself and then led on by his passions and he does kind of forget about the the dutiful wife because then you're kind of like well if he's his family man now if you do it really well i suppose you could just say no it's literally all because of the gods right and there's 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 no nothing involved and so i'm like okay there's a plausible argument that if you did it that way maybe but it doesn't make losing track of time and staying with a witch and then a princess like like it doesn't really make as much sense you know if, if he's he's like truly the dutiful man that doesn't make sense i guess if you do the the gods say you have to do this or you have to struggle or i mean I, I, and in this one you kind of have it where he's about to get to cersei and and Hermes comes to him and says, you know, like, she's gonna, if you want to save your men, you gotta do, you know, you, 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 you gotta eat the plant, and then you gotta kind of pull your sword out and threaten her, and then she's gonna ask you to sleep with her, and that's the only way to free your men, and you can't say no to a goddess. So I'm like, okay, I guess they tried to build it in. I don't know. It just doesn't, it still doesn't feel as poignant, I guess, if, if he's just mooning about after her the whole time yeah you know people can disagree with me that's fine but i did want to also point out <laughs> when we got to cersei's island why was it a full-on egyptian palace not even the outside which i was so, like that yeah. is an egyptian palace even on the inside did you see her throne was like literally tut's throne yeah and i was like what is this i have huge issues with how they did cersei and calypso because yeah. they're not portrayed as anything except greek greek goddesses but greek in the odyssey and what they do is they take cersei and they make her egyptian and they take calypso and they make her like african kind of nubian maybe and undefined it's just like she was cast as a black actress which is fine because colorblind casting yay but also the fact that like they made her ethnic i was not okay with it's less for me the ethnicity and more the the costuming and how how both women and or both goddesses and their maid servants are characterized they're set quite starkly against the civilized Penelope. She's like this chaste, wonderful Greek, Western, very Western queen. And then you have these two goddesses who are massively orientalized. And one is someone essentially in a bad Cleopatra Halloween costume with all of the surrounding paraphernalia and, and King Tut's tomb and all of her handmaidens like dressed in Egyptian garments. And then you've got Calypso who has braided hair and seashells and her handmaidens are, are similarly dressed. And, and they're both these highly sexual, very dangerous, threatening women who are othered massively by how they are dressed and how they're portrayed in the show. And I had huge issues with that because it feels like there's a lot of race essentialism going on there without necessarily the overt skin tone issue. But I, I didn't like at all using non-Western cultures to paint these women as dangerous, seductive, temp seductive temptresses when it's so strongly contrasted by Penelope, it, it felt very, just very uncomfortable. Yeah, I mean, I didn't like it either. It was an odd choice. And the only thing that I had to keep in mind as I was uncomfortably sitting through this was knowing that this was made in 97 before everything was super PC. And I was like, okay, fine i get only also because and and maybe for me i just tied it into like my own experience 
you know, I was born in 95 when when adopting kids from China was still all the rage that didn't that trend really didn't stop until like 2002 or something like that. But, you know, so in, in 97, I would have been what, like two. I want to say there was like a good period when I was little, like actual baby up to maybe five or something like that, where I just remember like people close to me and not in like an insulting way, but just because like they didn't know better and they didn't think it was rude. But they would either mention to like my parents or just say it where I was there, you know, that like they would just like say that I was like Oriental, right? Or I was like from the Orient. And like at that point, I was too young and I didn't see it as an insult because I was just like, I mean, I guess that's what we call like China, the Far East. It's like the Orient. And so I guess like me remembering people being like, oh my God, this is so adorable. What a lovely mixed family. Like that must have been so exotic going over to like the Orient to like adopt a child. How beautiful. And like, I was like, okay, well today that would be a very different thing, right? Like you would get called on that instantly. But that was a thing that was said. So like remembering that around when I was little made it track for me that like, yeah, okay, we've got these, like, Orientalist vibes. And back then, it wouldn't have been seen as, like... I mean, you would still get raised eyebrows because if you knew the source material at this time, you'd still be, like, not Egyptian, not, like, Nubian, Greek, Greek, Greek. But, yeah, I think just, like, the idea of... I mean, it's Orient unconscious bigotry, but it is still bigotry. You know, I was kind of like, okay, it's bad, and we can call call it now for what it is. When it was made, though, I was like, okay... I can see why these choices were made. I don't agree with them, but I can see why they were made. But yeah, it was bizarre. I was like thinking the whole time I was watching these snippets, these parts of the miniseries, which was like, yeah, yeah, it's, 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 this is what I hate about reception but also like it goes along with the idea that like <sighs> i hate it it's it's one of those things where i'm like i hate it but it's kind of needed because if it weren't portrayed this way then we wouldn't be able to call out when we see like the bad aspects of reception so i i, I always get like very conflicted because i'm like it's good that they had this so we can call it out and talk about it. Yeah, and no, it's, also, and it's, definitely, it's definitely a good thing to be able to. I don't know. And also, I was like, well, I don't want to, like, completely squash creativity. I mean, like, now, don't make this. For sure, don't do it. But back Well, the thing is, I think, I think if you wanted to do that, if you wanted to make Circe and Calypso cultures other than classical Greek, because it gives you a sense of, like, the scope of the the geographic spread that Odysseus is traveling. I think it can be done. I think what you have to do though, is make it so that these women aren't inherently like bad, quote unquote. Don't over-sexualize them and then have your wife be like the paragon of goodness and everything else in the world. I mean, I don't know, like sex, I, I would love to see a sexed up Penelope just being out here like, like we always get this idea of her with the suitors right being the very chaste like i'm just going to like i'm going to weave my shroud as i'm sad and pathetic and and just up in my rooms i'm like what if and and so so instead of a penelope who fends off the suitors by just being like i'm so sad i'm i'm the i'm the original sad girl and i'm just gonna weave in my rooms what if we got a an adaptation with penelope where she was like super sexed up and she was like I'm using my sexual wiles to keep you waiting and it's it's all a game for me because she's like instead of you coming here to judge me and see what sad things I'm up to what if she's like I'm not gonna pick because I need you all to like do sexy things so I can judge you and see if you know part of part of her choosing a new husband was okay well what what's your you know virility like like I don't know make them compete in sports 
you know, order them around, be like, okay, you go here and do the thing. And then I will judge you against this man. I don't know, like do something fun. I mean, with that kind of adaptation, she could really easily start pitting them against each other by like changing her favor every other day. Yes. Right? Like, she has so much power since they all want her. Oh my god, wait, wait, wait. I walked myself into the model. It is! It, it's <sighs> literally the bachelorette, right? It's one woman in, like, a house with, like, 20 dudes competing And the axe thing is, like, the final challenge. Shit because she can't put them off anymore. To propose to them. Right? Like, like, wheedle them down, like, as one fails or fails to impress, send them home, they don't get a rose, blah, 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 be like, no, you know, I'm like, instead of just keeping 20 around, like, mooching off you, I'm like, girl, do bachelorette style shit where you eliminate, like, one to two to three, it increases, so, like, every, but instead of, like, every date being, like, the next week, you just, you know, for the 10 years he's gone, be like, okay, we have a year to do the dates or the challenges. And so after every year, I send like two home, right? Oh my God, please someone turn. I want to see an adaptation. I want to be literally someone be like, take the bachelorette and literally just that would Penelope be fun. Each of the suitors and then your own. <gasps> I want, what would we call it? Um, the bachelorette, uh, like, like, um, Odyssey season or something like that. Ithaca season, right? So like the man, instead of like the actual mansion they use, make it her palace. Uh, the only thing we couldn't account for is like Telemachus, but, oh no, no, it's perfect. You know what? They cast like a historic bachelorette where it's like, I'm a single mother and I have a child. So like part of your challenges to win me over is you have to like be nice to my kid. And that's what would have kept him safe because instead of them plotting to like kill Telemachus, she could have been like bachelor style. Okay, well, if I'm going to choose you, what are you going to do? You have to, like, show favor to my son, obviously. You have to talk. You take him out for ice cream. I want this. I want a bachelorette style. Like, why are we deprived of this? Because that's literally what it is and it could be. Mind blown. Ah! Okay, I know we're, I just went off on, like, the most tangent of tangents. But you know what? It had to be said because this is our Odyssey season and it was going to come up at some point. And you know what? This is like the perfect adaptation to bring that up because she is being held up as like the paragon of whatever and goodness. And and she is taking on her like sad girl role of I'm doing my show. Yeah, I mean, right? the veiling like, makes perfect sense. Covered, like, like, appropriate. Just, like, but then gone. drawing the veil across the bottom half of her face is not something I have seen before. That was interesting. Mm. yeah maybe. no I, well like didn't sylviana magana in the 19 what was it 58 ulysses yeah. didn't she have a veil although Sorry. she like wore it on her i wanted head, to ask you face i think what did you think of the underworld the way they did the underworld scene because he like he has a ram and he goes across this river on a bridge and down I guess, like, for this adaptation, it made sense just because of the stylistic and set choices that they made. Normally, though, no, because I just don't... Well, also, I think it depends on, like, what you want to see from a certain set. I mean, I guess if we're going for, like, the Percy Jackson-esque underworld... It makes total sense that he goes down and is like a giant ass palace and then you just like go into the palace in the underworld and then there's like fire everywhere around it and even in it but it's like still a palace for this to be like like random fire ghosts were all like fire and i was like that is they're supposed to just be shades like so to have something so close to the original source material but then avoid the whole just put blood in a trench and only allow the ghosts to drink from it was weird given that they don't shy away from blood and gore and the rest of it it felt a little strange for them not to sacrifice the ram or goat right but he threw it into a pool of lava he didn't like there was no well they did but he just like threw it in a what was that, was that a fire pit you're supposed to bleed them <laughs> 
And then you compare it to something like Odysseus' Voyage to the Underworld, which is completely bonkers, not following the story at all. And yet they included a trench full of blood. So you see elements put in the thing you don't want to see done. And then the thing you do want to see done, they don't have it. This is where my brain just goes, ugh. I mean, we are being completely nitpicky, but you know what? With the adaptations that don't make sense, you can't be because you have to suspend all everything. But I feel like for the adaptations that are closer to the source material, I think we're allowed to be more nitpicky because if you're going to choose to stick to the original and then you make choices that like don't really make sense, I think I get to criticize you. Yeah. I mean, okay. I don't, uh, let me just put it this way. The story it, it sticks closer to the original, which I liked. The acting, despite some questionable things, is mostly okay. Design, and I don't like the set design. There were, there were lots of loincloths. I mean, there were, there's loincloths and everything, but I think it's like, yeah, but, but there were lots of outfits that were just loincloths. Oh, right. Well, okay, but do we chalk that up to like they were? Yeah, but then Tamalicus the goes in front of the Ithaca assembly in a loincloth and a cape. Where is your shirt, sir? You get lost on the way to the laundry. And everyone else, like, if it, and th that, yeah, if everyone else was dressed similarly, it would have been different, but everyone else had actual clothes on. And some of the suitors had like breastplates. And then Telemachus is just there shirtless with a loincloth and a big red cloak. What? Why? 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 That's true. Well, although we want to talk about style choices, at the very beginning, we see one shot. Interestingly, we see one shot of Agamemnon and Menelaus. And I was like, I mean, that is closer to the way they are described with the very curly hair and the curly beards. But I couldn't help but kind of think that in the way they overcurled them, I was honestly kind of getting like Persia vibes. They looked kind of Assyrian. It, it looked a little bit like a near Assyrian palace relief. And then the, the king of uh, Phoenicia is similarly curly, but with bright blue eyeliner, which again was an interesting, sorry, bright blue guy liner. Again, an in and I have zero things against men in makeup. I think it's a wonderful thing. But it just felt, again, given that no one else is, is wearing similar things. Yeah. But, but did he get the guy liner because he's the king? So he does have to be the most flamboyant one there. Maybe, but then you have Odysseus being all like manly and, and pinnacle of civilization and he doesn't have anything even remotely effeminate except the occasional loincloth. But since in this one, he's not like got amnesia and about to... I mean, Alcinous is a protagonist assisting character in this adaptation because he works out who Odysseus is and gives him a ship and sends him off to Ithaca. It just, it feels a lot like the, whoever did the costume and set decided, okay, we need a culture that is not Greek. So let's make them as opposite. I mean, it was a very short scene, but let's make them as opposite as we possibly can to show that they're not Greek. And I just, I don't know, it, it didn't. It's hard. Cause I mean, <sighs> Somewhere on the internet, there's a floating me, not even a meme, sorry. Uh, there's a floating graphic showing Odysseus's journey from Troy, which is in Anatolia, obviously, to Ithaca, which is all the way on the other side of Greece in the Ionian Islands. And there's there's a graphic that shows literally the, the wanderings of Odysseus. So it does show he goes to different places, but obviously this is not the Aeneid. He doesn't go down to, like, Carthage. Um... He doesn't. He doesn't even um, to to Anatolia. So, uh, if you really wanted to be different, you would look at this graphic and say, "Okay, what places in in where where would he have stopped that has a distinct different culture from like mainland Greece?" Each of the islands did have their own unique culture. So I'm like, if you really wanted to be correct, you could portray different. Just, 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 just do the research. Centralize it to. Okay, so what did the, you know, what what can we find from this island or you know something like there's there's like a way to find different. I think you should just look at the map and see 
where it would make sense. So, I mean, okay, fine. If you want to put him on like an island closer to Anatolia, then if you want to do different, you could probably go with some mashup of Greek and Anatolian just because if they're closer to Turkey, then fine. They would probably would have a lot of influence. And then I'm not discounting that there were probably, you know, um, foreign influences and in trades. I, if you want to make a credible argument for why there might be some, some Egyptian influence, you'd have to demonstrate that he goes down to Crete because there is actual evidence of, you know, the ancients on Crete doing trade with, Egypt as the closest island but again you couldn't go full Egyptianizing but if you if you want to put you know one or two small nods to hey look there's some cross-cultural whatever at this time Egypt was already ancient by the time this was happening I don't know I just think yeah there's there's a right to go about finding difference because you have no short of, a, of options but the only thing that bothers me are like the culture so far that clearly there would not be anything i mean what was it in troy the odyssey like calypso's island literally looked like thailand and i'm like that's too far what are you doing the thing is i don't i don't even mind it in terms of historical accuracy if you want to use thailand or ancient china go for it just do it respectfully and do it in a way that doesn't make non-Greek, non-Western cultures automatically superior. I think that that's my issue with what they're doing. It's that they're just kind of picking something that looks different and exotic and using it as a costume instead of having any kind of cultural sensitivity and saying, maybe we shouldn't make the two women who are these seductive temptresses super orientalized. Like maybe we should be a little bit more sensible about this. Yeah, that's true. I mean, I guess I wouldn't mind that. I, I am a bit of a purist, especially when it comes to Homer. When it comes to other things, I'm like, okay, okay, fine, 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 leeway, leeway. I don't like usually being the one who's like, no, it has to be closer to the original. But Homer's so legendary. These are quite famous, quite well known. And And the thing is, unlike a lot of other pieces, this is very specifically situated right like okay you, you know you can you can kind of take liberties with other things but i just feel like if you're gonna do the iliad we know they're going to anatolia so the only difference you should have is greek and anatolian i'm sorry that's i i think you you shouldn't put anything else in because it doesn't make sense and so for me yeah the same with the odyssey i'm like we know he wanders or he's, he's he's literally going in the opposite direction of asia and it's like it, it, you know, and it's not even just the Mediterranean. It's he's literally going in the opposite direction of Asia, right? I'm like, okay, if you're going toward Troy, maybe, but I'm still just like, you're you're going towards Italy, dude. So I'm kind of just like, ee. I mean, kind of like same with Aeneid, almost like it's so situated. It's literally Troy to Italy, Troy to Rome, with a detour in North Africa. That's so specific. So if you're gonna put in like Polynesia. I um, I'm I'm not gonna love it, but yeah, and in, in in most other cases, I think fine. Use a different culture, do it respectfully. Yeah, I don't know. I, I'm a Homer purist. Can you tell? I can. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. And on 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 the the front of Homer purity, what did you think of Telemachus in this one? You know, it was hard for me to really feel a connection because the scenes we got with him until the end, right? We're like so stunted. You have him as a baby, he's born. You're like, great. And then you get this one little scene where he's running around playing with Eumaeus and then he kind of runs into the home, sees mommy and then is like a little boy. And then you're like, okay, that's done. And then he kind of time jumps again until finally you see, okay, Suitors are starting to arrive. He's older. He just, he's, you know, he, he sort of complains, but but he doesn't do much until the end. Um, not one of my favorite. Also, I couldn't connect with the actor's performance. I, I've seen, I've liked other actors' portrayals better, 
but again he's such a set character it's really hard to do much with him he's got his entire plot line written out you know i but but then again i know people could make the argument well if if you you know can find a billion different ways to do penelope then you should be able to do the same thing with telemachus but i, I don't know how I've always felt that you could do more with Penelope because even though you're told she just kind of does one thing and this is her character, there's a lot of like room in that. And I've always felt like there's more room for her than for him. What do you? I think you're right. When you're not given so many like concrete points that have to happen. And with Penelope, we're not really. She weaves and then she has this contest. There's a lot of silence in there that can be filled creatively while still having the weaving and the final contest with telemachus he appears less but what he does is that there's more fleshed out more activity fleshed out that you if you're trying to be true to the original you kind of have to do so you've got to have him complaining and, and butting up against the suitors you've got to have him finding Odysseus before anyone else and, and everything in between. I did think that, so Telemachus is not one of my favorite characters. Circe, the Circe book that we read by Madeline Miller, I enjoy that Telemachus, I think, more than others because it's not Telemachus, it's a character with the same name. This one is Telemachus as written and he's incredibly annoying and very whiny. <sighs> but there's a little bit of character growth and development right at the very end, which I I kind of enjoyed. He goes from like whining a lot and being unable to string his father's bow and complaining to, you know, calling the the assembly of Ithaca and demanding a boat and well, he doesn't yeah. He demands a boat to go and, and look for his dad and then comes back and obviously is a furiously angry young man who slaughters all of the suitors. And I did quite like, I did like that shift from Odysseus orchestrating or committing all of the murders, executions, whatever it is we're going to call them. I liked the change of having Telemachus do that because the Odysseus who comes home is travel worn. He's lost all of his friends and companions he's tired he just wants to be home with his wife and this is kind of the last thing he ha he has to do before he can resume life and what he says when i can't remember which suitor one of them says well, why are you doing this we've broken no laws and he said you tried to steal my world and that little interaction and odysseus saying you tried to take literally everything from me there are consequences for that i felt was much more suited to him as a like a grown man who's been all through all this shit and then telemachus just pure adolescent rage i thought was um you know very well played and for me tracked a little more than odysseus just slaughtering everyone yeah that's true that's true i mean i guess he as a character was given even less in like the Ulysses adaptation mm -hmm. we saw. I mean, that was just, I'm mad. The suitors are terrible. And then dad comes back, slaughters everyone. And he's like, father! Hey! And that's it. Mm -hmm. You know, so you're like, oh, okay. Yeah, I, I. he's not one of my favorite characters. And a lot of times people ask me, like, why? why? And I'm like, well, it's not because, unlike, like, Paris and Helen, right? I'm like, he's done nothing to make me hate him. He just... He 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 doesn't to me have like a very big personality. There's not a lot of flavor or character. Though. He's just like what you know about him is that he grew up without a father. He's protective of his mother, obviously, so he has problems with the suitors. And then you know that when dad comes home, yeah, of course he's gonna be the dutiful son who helps him <clears throat> plot. And that's kind of that. And I don't know if it's like because I I feel like I like the more exploratory nature of a lot of people he just doesn't seem to have a lot of purpose beyond that mm -hmm. so it's just like hard to take him in now that's i think why the the cersei one stands out because you're like oh yeah. you took a character who i thought i knew because he had like <clears throat> one purpose in life 
and then you did all this with him yeah i just uh he's 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 Telemachus is, he is. is what he is. He's <laughs> the, like, it's the only thing I have to say. Like, any adaptation I see Telemachus, I'm just like, oh, look, it's you. It's Telemachus. <laughs> okay. You know, so whether he shows up as, like, a little boy, I'm like, okay. He's just going to grow up sad and alone without his daddy. And then if you see him when he's grown, you're like, okay, so his only purpose is keep mommy safe and find daddy and help him carry out revenge so i don't know i'm just like okay you're kind of bland you 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 have a purpose go forth and do your your thing i think telemachus and penelope are hard because all they do in the epic is wait they wait in different ways but they're, they're just yes and you're trapped in this endless cycle yeah they're just waiting for odysseus which makes it tricky but you know the thing about being caught in this constant waiting and again i'm gonna i'm gonna reference the uh, wonderful education i just got in greece it's something my 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 professor said in our migration and asylum class as we were talking about the like migrant journeys and she had this entire week dedicated to the the concept of of, of waiting um and it rings true now certainly but i i have actually gone back and sort of applied it to this story and it still slaps but there in, in endless waiting right there's the idea that you can't move forward you can't move back when you're stuck in this limbo there's the idea that you're like inherently in discomfort but there's also there's the idea that you're constantly also in motion which doesn't make any sense right and so when my professor was like try to think of yourself as being constantly on the go but also stuck in the mm -hmm. waiting and i really didn't know what that meant i was like what do you mean and then she explained it and then i was like oh right but it's true though i mean when you are waiting you can't plan ahead you can only dream of, 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 well, you can dream of the future. You can't plan it. You can dream of the past, which you cannot go back to either. But what it does is it, it does the unique thing of it's the only period in a life in which you do kind of freeze, right? Like everyone talks about how, oh, I wish I could make this moment last forever. I wish I could freeze time. So when you're having a good time and you're like, oh, I want this to drag out and last forever. And then you're always like, but it never does. And it went so fast. I blinked and now something happened. So when you're kind of frozen as they are, there is nothing you can pull on. I mean, so when you see Penelope and you see Telemachus and you think, oh, well, they could be doing this. They could be doing that. Could they? Like, yes, because physically, unlike migrants, you're not stuck, like, in a waiting room, in a detention center. You're, so physically, they could, sure, they could do stuff. But it does serve as an equally interesting reminder that they are psychologically trapped. So, could, so, so you know, that's what makes them interesting, but that what makes them hard to do because then you're like okay let me just suppose for a minute that telemachus and penelope are able to physically go around and do things so then you think why didn't they go do this and that and the other thing oh i could create this story for them because i can make them move and go and do things but i love bringing in the psychological aspect which is okay you can move them like a chess piece but like are they actually accomplishing anything no. So that's what makes it hard because then how do you show on screen them moving around and doing stuff? But then how do you show this internal battle of like, well, in my mind, I am frozen. I can't. Right? So if someone's like, okay, come on, Penelope, choose a husband. I can't. I can't. Okay, don't choose a husband. But I also can't. You almost do have the ability to stop your weight, which is something a lot of people don't get. But the concept of being trapped and I suppose waiting is that you could take a any action, right? Like a lot of these migrants, like, well, they could go backwards. They could go home, but they don't want to do that. So they're going to keep waiting. So they're kind of mirrored, right? Because like 
Penelope can't go back. She's not left anywhere. She's home. She could go forward, but she doesn't want to. She can only go forward, but she's trapped. Just like the migrants are... So it's a very interesting duality there, which I always think about when I think about Penelope and Telemachus. You know, the most room they've ever had to me is how do you do an adaptation where you show what, how physically she could do one thing or is doing one thing while mentally she's not. But then again, it's a very small box to play in because again, even if you were going to do that adaptation, like a one woman show of Penelope, you know, you could probably do some really interesting thing where you have your set be like a room with four walls and then mm -hmm. you have her like have amazing dialogue and then you have like a door, right? And then you could do some like really sort of creative thing where she goes like in the door, out the door, in the door, out the door of being trapped in one wall to the other, yeah. you know? So you could like stage it in a really interesting way, um, which is an adaptation I'd like to see. But again, you're still limited because that's still not a lot of room to work with. What I would like, and this is kind of taking it and turning it on its head, as written at least, and the home of purist, and you may not enjoy this concept, but have it so that, have it from Telemachus and Penelope's point of view, and Telemachus is super young when the suitors show up, and takes one of them as a father figure, and Penelope is like, I can't wait forever, I would love to, but I can't life has to go on i have a son to think about and and have him like have telemachus and penelope right on the cusp of moving forward with this whichever suture it is as the new king as her husband as as, as telemachus father then have odysseus come back and have the slaughter of the suitors be odysseus rage because he has been forgotten and his family have moved on Ooh. Well, I am a Homer purist, but I'm always very pro. Let, let us do something completely different from perspectives from the characters who are often not heard from very much. So I would enjoy seeing that a, a lot, actually, because it would trap. I mean, we we know from the original source material, you're like, OK, I'm expecting it. He comes back and he doesn't like people mooching off his estate. So we just murder the suitors and we're like, woo. Go, Odysseus! I would love to find something that humanizes them. I mean, I know that the entire reason they're there is not, in a, you, you know, they're not talked about or ever portrayed yeah. in, in a good way. It is hard to do something. But yeah, I think it'd be fun to see, like, what happens if we do like the suitors. Yeah, how would that change the dynamic? Because then the homecoming, instead of the slaughter of the suitors being this big triumphant return where he gets his, his vengeance or whatever. It's a tragedy. Oh my god, turn it into like the Red Wedding. Because mm -hmm. he's he's killed Telemachus' father figure, that the only one he's ever known, and he's killed Penelope's new love and back, and it's great for him, but... Penelope, is she still happy to see her husband? I don't know. I think she's probably very conflicted. Because on the one hand, I'd be like, well, if we turned it into like a sappy thing where she like fell in love with a new su suitor, then she would be like not happy that he's dead. But then you're like, oh, but Odysseus is... Well, I guess in every adaptation, they get back together and then they're a happy family again. So I'm kind of like, it would be kind of fun to have him come back and then have her like hate his guts and be like, I don't, I don't want to take you back. Yeah, I'm just imagining the different things you could try to do within this small box. You know what? Actually, I want to see a one woman stage show of Penelope who can only go back and forth between two rooms. And I want her to read Natalie Haynes' letter dialogue that because... You that perfectly encapsulates yeah. the trapped, angry feelings, and then I just I want to see her like add to it, right? So you mm -hmm. have all of Natalie Haynes' stuff, and then I want to have this dramatic thing where she was where she writes more letters like, "Thanks to you, I am trapped. I could physically get up and walk out this door into the next room and pick a suitor and move on with my life, but like thanks to you, I like I could walk through this door, but I can't walk through this door mentally." Right, so I, I would love it. Well, you can't really make it a one moment. But yeah, okay, just stage a play where you have the suitors in one room, they're literally a door, and then yeah. her bedroom, and that's it. That would be interesting. I would like to see that. That would be very interesting. We have journeyed further than Odysseus has in our conversation, I think. It's been delightful. It's going to happen more often than when we do the Iliad, because the Iliad is just start of the war. Well, starting where we start and then end, and then we're like, okay, everyone goes. I'm like, 
when you're doing an odyssey you got an odyssey everywhere including <laughs> up here and with the other characters and okay i guess let's wrap it up with some final thoughts on the actual version we <laughs> not the one we wish we'd seen or the stage show that we're planning i enjoyed it i thought there was some questionable choices in terms of Cer uh, cersei and calypso but overall i enjoyed it very much i thought the characters were generally good i thought the use of the gods was campy but excellent second only i think to how they did it in troy fall of a city that was like my favorite god experience this is a close second i i did like that very much i thought that they did a really good job of fitting in the majority of odysseus adventures without making it feel too rushed and while this was not the odysseus that we know and love it was a good odysseus and i did i did like it and would you recommend this to everyone, classicists, non-classicists? Well, let's just actually, since you're <laughs> technically not. Let, let's just say to people who like, who study the ancient world or like general public. I, mean, I think everyone, it's, it's not like, it's not the best TV I've ever watched, but it was a fun three hours and I enjoyed myself. Do you think that this needs background though? Would you need background or would you be able to really get most of the original story? I don't think you'd need it. The way it's hung together makes sense by itself. They provide enough backstory that you have a feeling for what's going on. I no, I think it, it's fine without an understanding of, of the Odyssey. How, how about you? I will say I really ended up enjoying it. And I also found it interesting for someone who likes who generally prefers the Iliad to the Odyssey out of Homer's works. I found it really curious how I really did not like the Iliad portion, because usually I do, but I did not. So it was quite a journey for me because I was like, yes, we're starting with Troy. I'm going to get some of the Iliad. Woo! It's not just the Odyssey. And then I was like, no, leave it off, leave it off. Just start with him leaving. But yeah, overall impressions, I enjoyed it. I think it's good viewing for beginners, casual enthusiasts, classicists, other ancient world scholars. I appreciate how it tries to get most of the plot in. You know, it's not completely crazy like Odysseus' voyage to the underworld. So yeah, I think other than some questionable costuming and set choices i will say it was much better than troy the odyssey as well so you know if you're look i will say if you're looking for historical accuracy this ain't it but it's a great entertaining watch it's very much a product of its time 1997 but i will say it was a treat to see a lot of these really super famous actors probably early on in their careers at this point so and if you miss christopher lee like i do it was entertaining even he, for the like a good on the screen. yeah yeah so i i the final verdict is i i enjoyed it and i would definitely recommend it to people to watch but please do not take this as very accurate except for the story but the characters are not <laughs> the most yeah also very quickly before we leave why is penelope pressing olives to make olive oil she's a queen why was she doing anything? Wasn't she like scrubbing the floor in one scene? Yeah, scrubbing floors, making olive oil. I mean, unless her goal is to make her seem like <gasps> like the every woman. She's not yeah, a queen. Yeah. She's like one She's of us. She's just a woman waiting for her husband. She's dutiful because she does all the chores. I don't know. Anyway, on that you note. Know, you know, I have... Yeah. If you want to hear us bitch about the weird things, I don't know, subscribe to our podcast. Maybe we'll release some bonus content because you know what? I would like to have a field day on their per portrayal of Hermes as this weird dude floating on his belly in like a real posed position. That was weird. And his face was like really creepy. So anyway, yes, that yes. Yeah. Thank you for joining us. And we'll see you next week. Bye. Bye. Hey, thanks for listening. Don't forget to leave us a review. And you can also follow us on social media at The Reading Party Podcast. If you'd like to leave us a book or movie suggestion, then email us at thereadingpartypod at gmail.com. See you next week.